This episode of the show is brought to you from the Salesman.org HubSpot Studio. Coming up on today's episode of the Sales Leadership Show. I mean, new logos are never not going to be part of the portfolio, but uh, I think pretty much everyone could agree that it sort of maxes out at 20% of your number in any given year. Right, the product's not the hero anymore. It's the services you wrap around it, the personnel that you bring to bear. So whether you're doing building automation, HVAC, and that kind of service, that's now a managed service. Well, the first thing we have to recognize, it just isn't all contained in sales. Like every one of these, I'll just, uh, uh, an overused term is to call it a play. Hello, Sales Nation. My name is Will Barron, and I'm the host of the Sales Leadership Show. And on today's episode, we have the return of Tim Reisterer. He is the Chief Strategy Officer over at Corporate Visions. He is the author of the book, The Expansion Sale. And that's exactly what we're getting into on today's episode of the show. How to, from a perspective of being data-backed with all of Tim's uh, comments and thoughts in this episode, how to expand your current customers from a leadership level and drive tons, tons more revenue post-pandemic. Everything that we talk about is available in the show notes of this episode over at salesleadership.org. And with that said, let's jump right into it. Tim, welcome to the Sales Leadership Show. Hey, Will. Good to be here with you. It's good to have you on, sir. So on this episode, we're going to cover the post-pandemic uh, expansion sale. We're going to be referencing the book, I'm sure, the whole way through the expansion sale. And I'm going to ask you a, uh, this is probably bad interviewing, right? This is probably bad sales conversations to ask you a massively leading and loaded conversation to get us going, but it'll frame things up. So sales leaders, sales managers listening to this right now, Tim, should we be focusing on net new business, new logos, or would it be a wise thing right now, post-pandemic, to be focusing on how we can expand within the accounts that we already have? Yeah, I don't want to be Captain Obvious or have an uncanny <laughs> grasp of the obvious. I mean, new logos are never not going to be part of the portfolio, but uh, I think pretty much everyone could agree that it sort of maxes out at 20% of your number in any given year, and 80% of your number is driven by your existing customers. So then the question really becomes, are you planning accordingly? Are you preparing? Are you equipping and enabling correctly and appropriately for that motion? And, um, and so what I would say is, Yes, uh, unlike maybe last year when the pandemic first started, where honestly new logos went to zero because everybody just hunkered down. And when you do, scientifically, we, co we, we talk about people's status quo bias. Mm -hmm. You really retrench to what is your last known safe, and that is what I'm already doing, right? When the world is scary, last thing I want to do is something scary, like switch vendors or partners. And so I think companies got used to the fact that if they were going to make something happen, they had to work with their existing accounts. And what they're all starting to realize right now, especially as companies all move into this sort of recurring revenue model in one way, shape, or form, is that that really expansion is the new acquisition. And that's where the time and attention needs to go. For sure. I, I, I think we have doubled down on this point as well of uh, software as a service SaaS model that everyone's going to recurring subscriptions. So I used to sell medical devices. 100% of the time, big capital outlays. And just as I was leaving the organization, they were moving to um, service models. Now, I spoke to someone in the organization the other day. He wanted to have a catch up. So I jumped on the phone with him. Uh, he had a good old laugh at my expense of my uh, mistakes and some of the stories that went round of uh, kind of what I did then and what I do now and that side of things in the organization. But he said they're almost completely now selling services. So a monthly um, service contract for a whole operating room, a, a member of staff to live in the room, to maintain everything, to look after the recordings of the endoscopic camera um, surgeries and that side of things. And he said the whole model is that. And he said over the past five, six years, he's shifted from, I said, 100% capsule to this. So it isn't just affecting, I guess, the stereotype of uh, software, products, Salesforce, HubSpot, these kind of cloud-based apps. It's affecting everyone, isn't it? Not at all. It, I mean, yes. In, in fact, right. The product's not the hero anymore. It's the services you wrap around it, the personnel that you bring to bear. So whether you're doing building automation, HVAC, and that kind of service, that's now a managed service. Um, and, and any of the sort of equipment and, and tool cribs and other things inside of manufacturing plants are all outsourced as a, as a managed service anymore. So you're right. Um, if you put an MRI machine in, you didn't buy an MRI machine anymore. You, you bought the service with it. In fact, you probably pay by the scan mm -hmm. uh, for the use of the equipment and the throughput as opposed to buying the capital equipment. So suffice, to, suffice it to say the entire recurring revenue model where uh, 
keeping and expanding your customers is the entire motion of the company is consuming every industry. Is there any sign and I guess any research or data on this that's been measured right now would come out months from this date because it have to be processed, right? But is there any sign that this hunkering down of buyers, whether it's a current customer or whether it's someone that we're going after who is new, is there any sign that some of that is letting up? There are signs that it's letting up. I think the, the big question everybody has is, um, how do I go meet those people? How do I break through and 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 create that level of, of contact and and start to build that level of rapport that's required for them to reconsider their current partner and maybe leave to choose a new partner. And I think the bigger question has become, okay, now that it's opening up um, from standpoint of interest, but it's not opening up from the standpoint of physical presence, what do we need to do different to acquire new logos? And so that's the kinds of conversations we're having. And I think it's interesting because if you think of a salesperson who used to go out on the road, they only had so much time to have so many meetings. And um, now, if they don't go out on the road, you've now got potentially increased capacity. When they were on the road, they had the excuse, well, I made one or two calls. And um, then when I went back to the office, I only had a little bit of time to do some uh, legwork. Now they're in the office. And the reality I keep talking about is the productivity and the persistency has to go up because now we have the time, the bandwidth, and, and the tools really to insist on, hey, we got to do 10 touches to get that contact. I can't give up after two. So what's happening is I keep saying salespeople now are being put on a cadence instead of on an expense account. And everybody's going to find that that cadence is more productive and more persistent than we were when we were out in the field. And everybody's going to have a big old debate at some point, like, do we really want to go back in the field? Do we really want to sponsor an expense account? I really kind of prefer this cadence thing. So I think we're in for um, uh, sort of a real conversation about the disposition of selling talent. We're going to go slightly off topic here, but what what are your thoughts on it from a buyer's perspective? I know a lot of the work that you do is focused on what the buyer wants as opposed to what salespeople want to spam into the marketplace, which may or may not work. Do buyers want salespeople uh, sales leadership, sales teams to be communicating over Zoom? Or do they want that touch, that uh, that in-person meeting, that ability to physically hand over documents, whatever it is that mm -hmm. we once had in the past? Are they bothered? Well, yeah. I mean, before the pandemic, everybody would have said, no, we don't want to do this over Zoom. How impersonal is it? Now that it was forced, everybody's like, huh, <laughs> I, guess we, I guess we can do that. And, um, and uh, I didn't know that was a thing. And now it is a thing. And I'm seeing data, not our own data, but like Bain has come out with, uh, Bain Consulting has come out with some data that's like three out of four buyers are totally happy and comfortable doing it over virtual whatever format that you use and aren't sure that they think they need to meet with people in person. That's three out of four who I'm guessing would have probably said, yeah, I think we should probably meet in person. Um, we all learned how to buy things at increasing dollar levels over Amazon. And Bain was also saying that the move from what are you willing to buy without ever having physically met a salesperson has moved from hundreds of thousand dollars to now at least a million dollar threshold. So um, the willingness to do it, as well as the dollar revenue attached to the deal is going up. So it's here to stay clearly. And the question I think is what percentage of a deal cycle, as well as entire deals is done virtually. It's not a matter of going um, back to anything that looked like before. For sure. And I guess uh, to to use the corporate vision's language, we've, we've broken the status quo, right? The status quo was salespeople come and visit. We sit there, they take us out for tea, coffee, golf, whatever it is. And uh, and that's clearly now changed. So with that said then, Tim, how, and I wanna, I'm trying to leave this as open-ended as I can. Um, are there any frameworks or what do we need to do to re-equip our sales team to communicate um, the, the messaging, to expand the sale? How do we re-equip our team to do this at scale when everyone is sat at home or sat in an office, whereas we would be on the ground otherwise? Well, I think there's you know, a couple of things we're seeing is that, again, because when, when we used to try to help salespeople with technology and enablement content, they were out in the field, in the planes, uh, in their cars, and, and, and they would or wouldn't get around to entering stuff in their CRM or would or wouldn't get around to looking at their content. And they would just sort of shrug their shoulders and go, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Meet with customers or play with your little tools? And now all we have are our tools. So I think one of the things we have to realize is the, the opportunity is ripe. 
But the problem is people found out they put these tools in place, but there were no habits formed. And the tools themselves were just empty vessels and something had to be in it. So if you have a sales engagement platform that tells you, this is what you do today to this person, to that person, to that person, you get 30 tasks in the morning. And one says, send an email. One says, leave a voicemail. One says, do a social touch, but it doesn't tell you what to say or how to say it. And there's no content attached to it. All of a sudden people are just making stuff up or they're frustrated because they the only value added there is I have 30 tasks, but nothing to put in there. So what companies are starting to realize is these tools created a rigor and created a structure, a prescription, if you will. But now they got to put something in it. They need to put message like a cadence should be a smart cadence. And then maybe what they should do is some A-B testing so that they can have a certified cadence. This is the one that works best. And then move that into the field and say the way we're going to help you be more successful is yes, we're going to put you on a cadence, but we're going to give you messaging and content and skills that match that. And we're going to go out and test that so we can tell you this with confidence that this works best. And, and I think that's what companies are trying to figure out how to do to scale this, is look at the tools, look what's being expected of sellers, and trying to pre-populate and fill that with cross-functional input and cooperation and create some sort of prescriptive um, message content experience that then sales can execute against. Uh, and that's how you get this at scale because otherwise I'm now at home and I'm faced with all these tools that I was able to shrug off before. And now they're my, my workflow. Um, and, and we got to do better than just teaching them how to turn them on. How do we know if we have the capabilities to do what you just described to build out this prescription, this this process internally? And how do we know when we need to bring in help to, to make some of this happen? Well, the first thing we have to recognize, it just isn't all contained in sales. Like every one of these, I'll just, uh, an overused term is to call it a play. But each of these plays is really cross-functional. So when I think of like an acquisition play or a retention play or an expansion upsell play, there's database creation and going in the tool. There's information and profiling of those targets going in the tool. Marketing does that. And now here's some campaigns and some scripts and some other things that go into that tool. Marketing can help there as opposed to sales. Just now here's your engagement tool. So I think what companies have to do is they have to think more uh, cross-functionally and, and how this, this prescriptive play has stuff put in it from marketing stuff that sales has to do against that and maybe supported by sales enablement. And then because most of these things, acquisition, retention, and expansion, all at some point touch your customer support, customer success team, they're part of that mix as well. So um, the way we're engaging with companies right now is looking to build these specific plays, acquisition, retention, expansion. And in each case, how does marketing sales and, and customer success work to more or less degrees in each one. Mm -hmm. And the message, the content, the skills, and the tools are all integrated into that play. And so it's the, I don't, you know, the, so the co-op in the culture is the cooperation there between those departments are the, are the tools in place and are, is the know-how in place to do that. I think people are turning at this point for to accelerate this by bringing in some outside partners to at least get some of these prescriptive plays in place so that they can begin tweaking them for different scenarios that might pop up or different um, markets that they're targeting or different competitive responses. But getting the tracks laid sometimes requires a little outside help. For sure, totally agree. And you might you might make a few of these sales leaders listening right now frown slightly, but who should own this? If one person, one executive, uh, one group of individuals should own this process? Should it be marketing? Should it be sales? Should it even be some of it customer success if we're looking at upselling within accounts? The creation is cross-functional. And what I found inside of companies is you don't know which of those, Just be, you can't just say, here's the department that should lead it. It's it's the person who who sees the bigger picture, right? Who transcends those three departments sure. in their vision? And so I always say, we're looking for somebody who gives a <laughs> somebody who gives a somebody who gives a crap. Um, we're just looking for somebody who gives a crap. I don't care what department they come from because really they have to work together. And and so is it somebody? Is it a company who put a CRO in place who thought they were head of sales, but really now we need to expand the wings? Um, or is it marketing because generally they 
they build strategic processes and they implement things like this. And arguably the customer journey is very digital and self-service. So they're like, you know, we own a lot of this. We might as well, you know, help integrate the rest of it. Um, I think customer success is just figuring it out. They're building these teams and they're just trying to, you know, keep adoption up, keep NPS scores up. So they're still trying to figure out how to be commercially savvy because they're really just trying to do what's defined in customer success. So it's going to emerge probably from sales and marketing, but I'm going to see and argue that possibly that what what maybe we all thought was a, a goofy sort of idea of chief revenue officer or revenue optimization or revenue enablement is actually going to it be not just some sort of uh, clever, cheesy new title. I think it's going to be almost a mandatory responsibility. Do you, do you see this? Um, how do I phrase this? With, with how you commented on your own customers. But you, is this a problem? Is this a hurdle? Is this a status quo that you have to uh, break when you go into an organization and you start talking about some of this? Is it difficult to find that one individual who you can say, hey, you are you light years ahead with your thinking of everyone else? Let's give you some of the ownership of this. Is that it? Almost seemed Tim that you were. Um, it's a, it's a problem to find that individual who can buy in and, and make all this happen. Yeah, I mean, you are looking for someone who who cares about maybe a little more than their their on paper remit, right? Sure. So I was just talking to a client this morning where all of this is being driven out of marketing, like they're bring, building new messaging and launching that messaging in skills courses to help the sellers. Uh, up level their capacities. But then in the next breath, we're talking to chief sales leaders and their sales enablement heads who are looking at their jobs and going, I'm really enablement of everything. Mm-hmm. And 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 I think there's an opportunity there because honestly, sales enablement as a title has been vested with lots of responsibility, but not a lot of authority and budget. But they're also by definition, the people who I, I think are are trying to think of this as a process and trying to think of it as a, a, a puzzle that needs to be put together because enablement's always kind of been a pipe mm-hmm. that connected marketing and sales and is now figuring out how to connect customer success. Uh, the problem is that in the organization, they've just been at too low a level to, to, not, to, to be vested with the kind of budget and authority. Uh, I just heard a Forrester report that said they think by uh, 2024 that 50% of sales enablement will report to marketing. So, you know, whether that's an oxymoron or that's a trend, I, you know, it, it, what does that speak to? Well, again, probably to sales enablement has got the right idea, but it needs to roll up to a group that has more of that long-term strategic go-to-market planning view, as opposed to maybe quarterly number revenue view. Yeah. So I, I don't know anything about the data. I don't have the insights of clients that you do, Tim, but it seems like that's common sense. It seems like, or, or it's a chief revenue officer, someone like that. It seems like somebody with the uh, the modern buyer journey being so digital, so much uh, is done before they even speak to a salesperson. It seems like someone to manage the, you almost need, this would be even more cheesy and Silicon Valley-esque, but you almost need a chief buying journey officer or something <laughs> like that. Well, I, I, I uh, was recently quoted as saying, we need to stitch together these three operations in a customer conversation continuum um, because they're each conversations with the customers taking place at different inflection points, but the customer sees it as one single monorail they're riding. I'm just riding your company's monorail. And here we are like trying to jack <laughs> up all the different pylons to hold it up, right? So um, yeah, who, who, who transcends that and assumes that view, which is the view the customer likes to think they have and likes to think the organization is, is aligned to, uh, I, I'm, yeah, it's got to happen. I mean, it just literally, um, there's just no way this can't happen in the short term. For sure. Okay, so let's move back into the expansion side of things here. So we know, and we're, we're, we're hit over the head with this stick constantly that the the buyers are engaging with salespeople less uh, or later and later in the buying journey. How does the buying journey look from the perspective of a um, an expansion? Is it salespeople leading the expansion? Is it the buyer going into the product, getting more training, more data, um, kind of more marketing and say, hey, we want to grow this ourselves and then reaching out to sales? How does the buying journey look in the from a high level from the uh, expansion side of things? Well, the one thing it, it, it is, if you think of old timey sales process, you'd have your opportunity management for new logos and your account planning or account management for existing. 
And then companies had to decide for themselves, right? Are we going to split that job? Are we going to have them do the same job, but they just got to be situationally fluent? Um, that's like one of the things that's changing is that this influence of customer success has is, is taking the account management side of the seller's brain or that team and said, hey, we need to infuse in your desires to upsell um, this sort of ongoing dialogue. We need to have business reviews. We need to be documenting results and bringing these results. We need to be um, doing sort of uh, regular um, co-visioning sessions that 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 feel like relationship management, not account management, which is kind of still transactional and People think of moments like, oh, I got to launch this new product to my existing business, or I got to go after this white space. It, has, it moves from a selling mindset to a success mindset. In fact, I was talking to the EVP of sales at Salesforce, who's a client of ours, and he says, we're thinking of just calling it all customer success. We're in the business of customer success. Sales isn't even a thing. He says, I want to banish the word handoff. And, and so what I guess what I would say is that once somebody's a customer, Everybody needs to think they're in the business of customer success. Now, who takes most of the commercial responsibility? That's the question. Does the sales side of the, that initiative still own the number and, and run those, um, you know, run the opportunities with an existing customer with customer success's input based on their observations? So they're, they're like now, think of customer success as the demand generation funnel for, for account managers or, or are more and more commercial moments going to be vested in the customer success org because they're always there. It's a lower cost organization typically. And, and hopefully it's always building on something they're working on. And then you get the debate with customer success going, no, no time out. <laughs> we don't want to be sales. Ew. <laughs> you know? So um, I guess I'm giving you the lowdown on all the dynamics that we see when we're inside these companies and it's a little bit up for grabs everything in terms of org structure, but not in terms of the mindset and the approach. That's being settled as continuous business review oriented dialogues that document results, demonstrate investment and effort. Oh, and then by the way, let's talk about some potential other things. Uh, I think is that's a good mindset to be in as opposed to now I'm just gonna start transacting opportunities with my existing customers. For sure. So th there's a ton of questions about culture here that we could perhaps ask uh, the culture of in-sales teams. And if that was different, perhaps customer success would be more interested in uh, moving into that space. But is there any data on if customer success owns an expansion versus sales owns an expansion, I guess, from the profitability of it? If customer success is a lower cost part of the organization to run, uh, perhaps not commission based, sales is more uh, commission uh, laden. Um, clearly customer success will have to do less expansion to be more profitable versus the sales team. Is there any um, data on kind of that front of which one is more profitable as opposed to which one drives more revenue overall, which I would assume is sales? Yeah, not yet. And I would assume too, by the way, there's, there's a commercial mindset about how to get a deal over the line that I think when you're customer success, you're kind of like a subject matter expert on that customer relationship and your implementation. But it doesn't mean you have the commercial chops to manage a deal, close a deal, and get all of the different players involved in that transaction. And that's just a special skill set of sales that is, is going to be hard to match. So I think you're right. I mean, you might have a lower cost of sale, but I feel like you're you're going to get sales as they would have sort of just fell in your lap happened anyway, sure. maybe with a couple sort of Amazon-esque recommendations from customer success. Well, other customers <laughs> like you have bought this versus having a very um, um, systematic and um, commercial savvy uh, approach that sales brings. I think that all I'm saying for the salesperson in the customer success expansion is think of your cadence differently in terms of renewal cadences and upsell cadences as more business review oriented and be great at documenting current business results so you can build on that success as opposed to treating it like each one's a new transaction. That's the mindset shift there. Like just be a little bit more of a customer success partner who happens to have commercial skills. Uh, and I think that'll carry you a long way. How do you see this playing out over the next 10, even 15, 20 years, however far we need to look before some of this perhaps changes in that, as you described, the buyer are more than more than happy to spend not 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions online, sometimes without even speaking to a salesperson at all. They, 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 can, they can log in, especially with per seat pricing on products and things like this. They could scale, they can manage a lot of it on, on their own if the product is set up correctly and they've got good customer success. Will we get to the point where buyers just, there is no salesperson in the buyer's journey because the, there's a, the content is so good, um, the marketing is so good and accurate, the analytics, we can we can give people what they want when they need it to get them over the line, to break status quo, to do some of the things that salespeople typically have to do in person or uh, over a Zoom call, whatever it is. Will we ever get to the point where sales is l even less needed to the point where customer success does most of the job, so let's not bother creating this uh, whole part of the organization in its in itself? I mean, now we're just, you know, we're now we're just uh, trying to prophesy uh, the future. And and I, I won't hold you to this. I, I won't, right, I won't so call you up in a decade from now. And be like, Tim, you said this. Studies, and when I guess, <laughs> and when I hypothesize, I'm clear to say it so yeah. that no one says I've got any sort of crystal ball here. Um, I, I think that this is the reality that when when you think about now, when your solution becomes more integrated as a part of the service offering and experience of the customer. And um, it, it's woven into their DNA, if you will. And now you are clearly, you, you touch their data, you know this, you know that. That's, that's a little harder to just sort of go reverse auction it, right? Um, like even like AWS has got a, a large sales force that engages serious enterprises, but you can also go to their website and they got their price list there and you can buy their stuff. So I think that it, you, that's how companies are going to be in general. And then it's going to be sort of preferred method. And it's also going to be, am I, am I just going to buy this as a customer and I'm going to add all the value or am I going to buy this and expect that my partner adds that ancillary value to it, which which then requires just a working knowledge and integration with the business. So I think as companies decide what they're going to be, uh, that's going to dictate what level of sales and type of skills uh, will follow. Sure. Let me. I'll take a things a few step back. Then is it? Do you think it's more or less likely then that perhaps salespeople will become, uh, whether it's. Uh, with AWS, a subject matter expert on that and really be able to add value as a consultative partner as opposed to what we can perhaps get away with right now, which is a, a deal maker, someone that, in your words, can get the deal over the line. Yeah. I, I mean, I still think that's going to be a necessary skill because I don't think we're going to get fewer decision makers. And so somebody's got to help get a decision <laughs> done, enough. right? Yeah. Um, but I... I have a bias. I'm I, I'm a consultant by nature, and that's the kind of value I like to add. And I hope that our clients like see that as the value we bring, in addition to the intellectual property that goes along with it. So my bias definitely is toward um, that. But I'll give you an example. We're working with a company that does large managed services, sort of building automation. Um, but now they have a couple commercial motions, renewals. And then they have some upsells, like you might have this serve, you have our building automation, but you, you have our fire service, but not our security service. And, and so there's, there's sort of these um, other motions that, oh, you, you bought, you have our service contract, but you don't buy our parts. And what we're starting to see now are sort of these situational commercial squads being formed. And then they get on a cadence and they look at their target market, like who's got the service agreements that don't have the parts. Boom, they run a cadence to try and upsell parts. And here's a group that has fire, but not security and not this. Let's run some upsells based on what's installed and what their installed footprint is. And oh, by the way, this renewal just seems to be almost an auto renewal. So let's just put a light touch on that. So I think people are going to start looking at commercial moments and determining exact right um, staffing resources, skill sets, um, and channels and avenues. Not that we haven't done that. Like some people are like, oh, low volume that uh, that goes to somebody who's at a desk. Medium volume that volume that's somebody who goes to a strip mall and sells there. And then large volume we have cross functional strategic accounts. Um, I mean that's always been sort of the thing. But I feel like it's getting what I'm seeing is much more specific now. Um, especially when you have a company that's got this core platform of recurring revenue, and now they're doing spot commercial programming, messaging, content, skills, teams. To, uh, and cadences to go after that. 
Um, I'm that's what I'm experiencing right now. It feels like the wave of the future um, to be that kind of targeted because the tools and the techno uh, the technology, the data, everything's there to do that. Is this and and, and coming to these um, commercial, I guess, insights, these commercial uh, opportunities to upsell? And it's an obvious one, right? If you've got our fire suppression product, perhaps you want to integrate it with our security product because they both go into the the same data center. We can we can do cool things with the app. We can do uh, multiple alerts, whatever it is. That seems like an obvious one. Do we when we move forward from this point onwards? Is it going to become more or less down to people's experience to spot these kind of things, these opportunities, or are we going to be more and more reliant on on data and, and algorithms and and uh, software to tell us that this customer probably, due to the history of customers like it, is probably going to look at this uh, other solution as well? Yeah, of course, the robots are taking over. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it's machine learning, uh, Will. It's it's AI. I, you know, so I'll stay with my building automation uh, example. They're trying to convert, you know, so some things are not just upsells, but some are like migrations. And they like still, boy, we have a lot of expensive field techs going out and doing this. Can't we convert all these people to our remote maintenance platform? And can't we get them all to come to our portal and self-diagnose, you know, and 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 start to go to the portal and realize, oh, I got some red dots there on my dashboard. Maybe <laughs> I should order some more of those because of the data feeding it in. So I am seeing hints of like moving on-prem service to remote diagnostic preventive service, moving people into portals as opposed to talking to humans so that things just sort of are automagical. I have to believe that at least Everybody who's building the technology and everybody who's looking at their company is thinking about these things. Now, I'm shooting myself in the foot if I don't think there's still going to be important customer conversations. But some of these are just going to happen in a self-service environment. I think humans are still going to have to hear a story, see a story, read a story, um, or be told a story in every one of these environments, whether it's self-serve or led by a salesperson or customer success. Um, so the ability to frame and tell a better story um, and have a meaningful, persuasive conversation is still part of it. It's just going to show up in, um, oh, gee, that was a social post or an email blast, or it was a um, message that popped up on my dashboard. Um, we're just going to have to look at where those customer conversation touch points are and make sure everyone is dialed in. So um, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> by the time that's all happens, Will, I'll be long retired from this business and, and, uh, and no one's going to be able to come back and haunt me. But it does feel feels like it's tipping the direction that we're talking about. Yeah, I won't name the service. <laughs> it's better because I, I can imagine what you might say about it. But there's, there's quite a few services that are popping up at the moment that are claiming to use AI. It's not, clear, it's not really AI. It'd be machine learning, whatever it is, to write ad copy, to write stories to be able to create content uh, what are your thoughts on these kind of services now tim because as a sales leader a marketing leader this seems like you can create masses amount of content at scale and really control the buyer's journey when perhaps our team isn't big enough to to do some of this at, at scale uh, otherwise is the legs to software tools like this when we're talking about um what what you guys specialize in which is conversations and stories and 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 really human psychology and, and being able to communicate at a, at a deep level to persuade people and to change status quo. Yeah, I mean, I think you can you can put frameworks in place to say if this is a new logo acquisition, these are the kinds of things you need to say. And in this order, they need to be said. And if they respond this way, you could probably put a library of choices in there. That said, we're doing an experiment right now. We just got the initial results. So I'm going to break the news here. Um, they we tested different value propositions and it was being read by an audience. So we had hundreds and hundreds of people reading these different value props. And really all we did is we took the same core story and we treated the value props differently. So one was, hey, let's just talk about the features because less is more. Oh no, we gotta talk about feature and benefit because they have to see what it, it not only what it is, but what it does. And then another one was, no, we have to add superlatives because you know, it's an all in one. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a one stop shop. Sure. It's the most streamlined, the most comprehensive. So we did a superlative version. Then the fourth version, we did something using the science of telling details, like adding extra details. Like don't just say you have the, a large database. You can be it's a database of eight hundred thousand potential truck drivers that you can review. And it's not just a large database. It's one where everybody's already had five year screens on criminal checks and this. So you give telling details 
and 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 it defies the whole less is more sort of thing and it adds more emotional language into it and by a moonshot the telling detail version emotional language layered uh extra phrases and numbers and specificity one and i i guess i don't know when the machine learning and the ai is going to figure out how to put the right telling details in at the right time, or even that telling details are better than, uh, cause it can only do what it's programmed to do, right? So we're still doing research and finding out how humans react to, to copy that inform the way we need to continue to adjust it so that we can distinguish and differentiate ourselves, not just sound like everybody else. And I gotta believe there's still gonna be a world and a need for differentiated persuasive content um, and, uh, we're going to keep testing it. We're going to keep finding some of these things. I love it because that sums up where I think we are with, uh, for, for better or worse, my opinion on this, Tim, where we are in sales, right? We can use enablement to prompt people to, to have message templates. We can do all this stuff. But what you just described is the difference between something that I would probably say. I would, If I'm talking to someone, I would probably share these details more likely than not versus uh, I wouldn't just have a conversation and say, we do these three things, then sit back on my chair and wait for the person to respond, right? There's, there's a human element to adding details to storytelling, whether we're trained in it or not. And I feel like we're in this crossroads where I've not I've used some of these AI tools to create copy and they've all been terrible um, so far. I'm sure they'll get better. That's why I didn't name any of them because I didn't know what you were going to say <laughs> on it. Uh, but they've all been terrible. And it seems like we've we know where we want to move, where we want to create salespeople, customer success people, even marketers that follow a script. We 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 just program them with what we think and what we assume that works, or what we maybe A B tested that works. But we're not quite there yet because there's a human element which is very difficult uh, to translate. It could be uh, you, even just the way you speak. If you're using certain words, language is incongruent to just read from a script. And I feel like that's super important right now as leadership, as we start using more of these sales enablement tools. There is still a talent element of all of this, isn't there, to to make it work when we get down to our individual sales contributors having those conversations. Yeah, just to your point, even right down to this idea of, do you have a best friend voice or do you have presenter <laughs> man voice, you know? Uh, so I, I agree. I, I, that, I don't believe that as long as robots aren't buying from robots, as long as it's still humans buying stuff from humans, uh, there's going to be room for this. So I, I, no dire predictions here in the near future. I think just adjusting and developing the right skill sets that will separate you. If I can real quickly tell this story, I saw this study, I don't think we talked about this last time, Will, where they studied 103 million hands of online poker. And what they discovered using all the analytics is that only 12% of the time did the best hand win. 88% of the time it was the best player that wins. And, what, and they said the best player is the one who told the best story by the way they bet, the way they bluff, the way they took cards, didn't take cards. So they told a certain story and they outperformed people who actually had better hands. That tells me there's a lot of room yet uh, for um, winning with the best story, uh, even at the expense of potentially a better alternative solution. So I, I think that's real, um, even in sports and other things that are super analyzed. Uh, so there's the opportunity for sellers. They just now, they got to figure out what it means to be the best player in the in the coming future. I love it. And uh, just to juxtapose your actual research data there with, I've got a friend who's a professional poker player and he plays online uh, exclusively and he pays thousands of dollars a month for this tool, which essentially starts to try and predict what's happening at the table. It will monitor all the tables within the, uh, I guess, website that, the, that he goes on to. So he can pick the table, I guess, with the biggest idiots that he can fleece. <laughs> um, to, to, to be blunt about it, he probably wouldn't frame it up like that. But, you know, people with... Uh, Where's the sport in yeah. that? <laughs> uh, so, but he says, what, which I find really interesting, because he tracks every day, tracks everything. It's all automated. And he can compare his uh, success and losses over the course of months, years, and probably even decades at this point. He has more success when he trusts his gut and occasionally goes against what the algorithm and the uh, the machine learning and the data is suggesting. And it's because humans are irrational, right? Right. The humans around the table who are playing with him, they're not being completely rational. They might have the same tools, but they're all using their gut feelings occasionally as well. And so he's, he's really clear of his data and the patterns. The, he's going to... Uh, 
publish some content on this in the not too distant future. So I'll, I'll link that in the show notes this episode when it does come out. Um, but when he trusts his gut and uses, I guess, uh, decades of experience with the game, he can beat the what the algorithm is telling him because it's not just us playing, is it? And it's the same with sales. It's not just the seller, it's the buyer. We're all irrational. We've all got cognitive biases. And uh, as you said, until we've got the the seller AI connecting with the buy AI and we're all out of jobs, uh, we're, we're probably uh, safe to say that there's an element of talent here that we need to always uh, keep at the Absolutely. back of our Absolutely. I mean, it's it's still the psychology of human decision-making at work. And I love that story on top of the study that I looked at because it, what they said was it's the one who situationally understands the psychology, which do, is, doesn't mean study. It doesn't mean they understand the rationality. In fact, as you said, they understand the irrationality of what's about to go on and they learn how to work that. They can build a story in the way they, the decisions they make that the other person sees that tells them that other player, what they want them to see. And the person with the best hand goes, I'm out, <laughs> you know? So, uh, it, very powerful stuff. I love these kinds of conversations. <laughs> love it, Tim. Well, with that, tell us where we can find the book, The Expansion Sale, and tell us more about what you're doing over at Corporate Visions and where we can find out more about yourself, Tim. Sure. So The Expansion Sale came out now just a year ago, and it's been a well-timed book. You can find it at Amazon uh, or any. Uh, it's published by McGraw-Hill. So where any books are sold, you can find it. Um, recently came out on Audible, as I understand as well. So Find that, the expansion sale, and all where all good books are sold. Uh, CorporateVisions.com. CorporateVisions.com is where the company I, I work with presents the work we do in the consulting and training around messaging and content and skills. We just recently start, branded our research work uniquely. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a URL called B2B Decision Labs, B2B Decision Labs.com. And we have started a, a much more formal um, research arm where we have behavioral study. We have a brain lab now. We have our own brain lab with the EEG caps and everything else run by a cognitive neuroscientist. And we have field tri trials. We have call centers that we're running field labs in to test out, let's say, messages and cadences and other things. So um, a real dedicated effort and brand new research like the stuff I was talking about in terms of differentiation uh, coming out from all three labs on a quarterly basis. For sure. That's super exciting. Uh, the audience will know, you may know as well, Tim, I, my background is in chemistry. I've been published in the, in the Journal of Computational Chemistry. And so when you talk about science, data, research, EEG, ECG, whatever it is, that gets me excited because, and I'll just, I'll big you up and plug you here slightly, Tim, in that there's so much BS that goes on in the same sales trading space. And and what you're talking about here, there's, there'll be You'll be saying this on one end of the the conversation with you know data and research to back you up. There'll be some red faced, bald, shouting man at the other end of the conversation trying to just share anecdotes and and share his experiences or her experiences. And you've got to lean audience sales nation. You've got to lean towards Tim and what he's doing because if it's research backed and the research that you're doing, it's so it's just so important in this space where there's just. Charlatan might be a strong word, but there's a lot of people saying a lot of things when there's no <laughs> evidence to support what they're doing whatsoever. We 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 call it unexamined folklore. <laughs> uh, we try to oh. euphemistically. Uh, so yeah, I, I usually say, "Where's your study?" And that's your like. I would I, I I'm not going to make these kinds of decisions and these bets without having some data to support it. So always a pleasure to chat with you. Well, with that, Tim, I want to thank you again for joining us on the Sales Leadership Show. Thank you, Will. My pleasure.